Welcome everyone, uh, my name is Greg Pierce, I'm the director at Jefferson Patterson Parking Museum and it is my pleasure to have everyone back in person for our 2021 speaker series. Our 2021 speaker series is exploring diverse traditions, so we're going to have a wide range of different talks this, this year. We're going to talk about the Piscataway culture, historically black beaches in southern Maryland, the archaeology of tattooing, and voodoo and the use of caves in Haiti as well as tonight's talk. Tonight's presentation is the first in-person talk we've had since 2019, so we're in incredibly excited just to have people back on site being able to uh, do anything with us. So uh, welcome and thank you. Um, before we get started with the talk, there's a few things I'd like to announce. Um, I'm also happy to announce that we're moving back to in-person programming, much like uh, with the speaker series. Most of 2020 was shot as far as having anyone on site, so we did a lot of virtual programming. We're proud to have been able to do virtual programming throughout the pandemic but we're also really proud to be able to move back into in-person programming. So we have our workshops, our summer camps, and everything else coming up this year. So a few things of note coming up in the next month. We have a blacksmithing workshop this Saturday, so folks can come in and work with our educator, Nate Salzman, and learn kind of all of the, uh, the tempering, the forging process, and create their own flint and steel. We have an archaeology hike this weekend as well. Uh, that takes about an hour and a half. Folks, uh, participants tour around the park and learn about the archaeological heritage we have here and the historical resources. On June 6th, we're going to have a smaller version of our Children's Day. Last year, we had to cancel it. This year, we're going to be able to actually do something. It's not going to be the full-blown Children's Day you normally see because of the pandemic and kind of uh, safety concerns, but we're still going to be able to have a number of uh, demonstrations and activities. We'll have a petting zoo as well as the Marvelous Mutts are going to come back for this one. On June 12th, we're going to hold a historical cooking workshop. On June 13th, we're going to have the uh, Bernie Fowler weigh-in. Last year we did a virtual event. This year we're going to do another in-person event that's going to be open to the public, so we invite you all to that. June 19th is going to be busy for us. We have Community Day, we have Village Day, we have Teddy Bear Tea going on that day. And then finally, starting in July, our in-person summer camps are going to start to go live. So anyone that's interested in all of this can go on our website. Uh, they can find all this information there, and if they want to sign up for summer camps, workshops, or these hikes, they can find them on our Facebook page and website as well. So, with all that, now it's time to move on to our guest of honor, Anna Cheney. Uh, she's going to give a talk tonight on regenerative agriculture, discussing sustainable ways to feed the world in a healthy and balanced way. Anna's a graduate of the University of Maryland has received the Earthkeeper's rights from Shaman in the Andes in the mountain, or from the Andes Mountains, has permaculture design certification, and is working with the Functional Nutrition Alliance to become certified as a, as a functional nutritionist. The focus of Anna's work is on human health and well-being, and how our wealth and well-being begin in the soil, and that truly nourishing food requires biocomplete living soil. She looks to complete or connect people to uh, nutrient-dense healing food and medicine to nature and to energetic health, inspiring long, joyful, and healthy lives. And that's what she's going to discuss tonight for us. So join me in welcoming Anna, and I'll hand this over to you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. There you go. Thank, thank you. Okay. So thank you very much for that introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, so I am Anna, and I am from Honey's Harvest Farm, which is located in southern Anne Arundel County. And I'm so excited to be here in person and talking to you and uh, expect to hopefully have a conversation with you afterwards. Um, we have a small little sampling set up from Honey's Harvest Farm of some of our products that you can take a look at. We have some free samples for you. And my favorite topic of all time is regenerative agriculture. And so, um, as was mentioned, I do believe that regenerative agriculture is a great way to really restore health to all, all sentient beings, the entire earth, and, um, and anything, anyone and any, anything that comes after all of us. So <clears throat> with that, um, if there's anything actually that anyone here would really like to learn about or know about, if you want to mention that now, um, I do have a full presentation to, to share with you tonight, but I want to make sure that I answer any questions or address any ideas or thoughts that you might have brought with you tonight. So if anybody has anything, please do let me know. Fine, raise your hand, nothing? Okay. All right, with that being said, then we're gonna move right on into the program. So, um, we all know that agriculture is imperative to our food source. So we're gonna move straight into kind of some different types of agriculture. And one of the things that I did do is grow up on a conventional farm. 
So I kind of did this little loop. Um, I, grew, I grew up on a farm where we raised corn and tomatoes and we did sell them on the side of the road up on Route 2, kind of coming south from Annapolis. And it was, a, it was conventional. It was all done the way that a lot of farms have worked around this area uh, for many years. And so I left and went to school at University of Maryland and then I got into the food service business. And so what I absolutely love is serving people delicious food in a fun environment. And so that, that really occupied a good chunk of my, my working career. And then what brought me back to farming was, of course, what kind of changes all of our lives is, is life experience. So I unfortunately got very ill. And for four and a half years, I was treated by conventional medicine, regular medicine, to no avail. So as the next step for me was a, a pick line to my heart for potentially an, you know, an indeterminate amount of time to feed the, the medicine that I had been taking every day. <clears throat> so I decided that wasn't for me. But I had three little children, and so I had to figure something out because I knew that I needed to get them to where they could take care of themselves. So what I did was start to kind of look around and search. And so I, I worked with complementary health and healing opportunities. And I tried a lot of things until finally I met um, the person who really carried me through in six months to full health and well-being and rejuvenation and felt like I was better off than I had been before this, this whole incident occurred. So <clears throat> I knew that someday when time and resources would allow, I wanted to, to figure out what that person did. And that person had taken classes from the school that I wound up graduating from, which was um, the Light Body School, which is located in Chile. And that is operated and, and founded by Dr. Alberto Viodo, who is a neuroscientist and a shaman. So it's a very interesting combination because he takes, he still works with medical doctors here in the States and writes a lot of his programs with the medical doctors, but he brings in the ancient healing practices. And the ancient healing practices depend upon nutritious whole foods that are grown in living soil. Very, very different than what we, I was used to and even what I had grown as a child growing up and learning how to make a living doing so. So what I've learned um, over the years is what conventional farming does. And these are, of course, are the negatives of the conventional farming. So I'm not against conventional farming. There may be a time and a place for conventional farming that works really, really well. Um, what I've chosen to spend my time and my life doing is permaculture farming. So what does that do? What is the difference? Um, you can see in the slides, and I think they're going to be online, so you can read all that fine print if you like. Um, but when we conventionally farm, what we see is the tillage and, of course, the um, machinery running over that tilled land constantly compacts the soil, which then prevents the water from soaking in. And what happens is we know when the rain comes, especially the deluges that we've been having the last few years, it washes away that really the, the little bit of topsoil that might be left. So what I've learned, which is really awesome, <clears throat> is... Um, how to not let that happen. But on top of the fact that we're, we're, comp, you know, we're packing, compacting the soil, we're also using fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides, which are salt-based, okay? So when we put salt on living things, or if you jumped into a tank of salt water and stayed there for a long time, what would happen? You dry up, <laughs> you would dry up. So that's what happens to the life in the soil. The life in the soil, it literally dries up and it cannot exist anymore. So we're going to get to why that, why that matters in just a second. So the cool thing about permaculture farming is it does actually allow the soil to regenerate itself because you're never tilling, ever. And you're, you're keeping something growing, like it looks like weeds. And maybe it is weeds, but you can control weeds with trimming. And some of those weeds are actually also feeding the soil. So we're going to get to that too. So um, let's see here. What else is in that that I want to say? OK. So this can be done on a large scale. And we'll also see another slide about that. 
So again, there's compacted soil. I saw this out in Minnesota. So I was really proud that while Maryland still has a lot of conventional farming, we are really good with no-till. And we have a very high percentage of our farms are doing no, practicing no-till agriculture. So we don't see this as much around here as, as out there, but that is prevalent. I mean, miles and acres just on and on and on. And I was there during a rain event and on the side of the road, there were, I mean, huge, like the size of these, um, this concrete over here, just running like a stream, fast stream right down the side of the road. So with all the soil going with it, just brown. I mean, it was unbelievable. So when you have living soil, this is what it looks like. And so you can see there are root systems in it, regardless of what kind of roots, there, as long as there are root systems, they're going to be protecting that, um, that what you see over here and you know, creating this, this life that I really want to get to, which is right here. Okay, so if you ever come to the farm on Sundays, we do a farm tour at one o'clock, and then as it gets hotter, we do it at 10 a.m. And um, we'll, we'll be offering them on Saturdays soon as well. We do talk about this, so you will be ahead of the game. And you will know. And when I talk at the tours, we have a lot of young children. So I have to get extremely animated to keep their attention. Uh, so we'll have a toned down version, but I'll still get a little animated because it's fun. So why is living soil important and why does it actually truly grow nutrient dense food and how do we know? So the premise of the way we do agriculture at the Honey's Harvest Farm and most regenerative agriculture farms or farms practicing permaculture know that what they have done is look at those woods right out there and say, why is that growing so beautifully without fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides? What's going on in those woods that we're not doing anywhere else. And we have to feel like we have to put all this stuff on it, you know, these additives and these things that kill things. And so what's going on is a synergistic relationship between the plants and the microbes in the soil. So how does that work? So a plant does what to make its own food? What is that process called that it produces? Photosynthesis, exactly. So we know that in real basic terms, we're taking the carbon dioxide from the air, and with all the inputs that the plant needs to thrive, it produces sugar, basically. So it feeds itself sugar, but it doesn't eat it all itself. It shares it. So I always ask the kids, who here likes sugar? And they all raise their hand, and then I say, who do you share your sugar with? And they go, <laughs> or sometimes you get the little girl that goes, my mom. Or the little boy that goes, my friend, my best buddy, you know? Like, okay, that's cool. Well, that's what the plants do. The trees, the plants, everything that we grow and everything that grows out here, they share about 50% of their own food with their best friends in the soil. So they literally take, put it out in what they call exudates, fancy word for feeding the microbes in the soil. So why do they do that? Why would they take 50% of their very special food that they made, that worked hard to make, and feed it to the soil? Because those microbes in the soil are the things that are making the nutrients bioavailable to the plant. How do they do that? So they get fed the sugar, they wake up. I think the plant even knows what types of microbes it needs to get the nutrients that it needs to thrive. So we have in the soil, the microbes are bacteria, fungi, nematodes, ciliates, all kinds of little microorganisms that they literally can go into the rocks, the crystalline substances, the clay, the silt, and they eat that stuff. The little microbes eat it. The plant cannot access the nutrients out of those things. So the microbes can, and that's what they do. But it's so nutrient dense that their little tiny itsy bitsy bodies can't use it all. So what do they do? What do we do when we have too much food? It comes out, right? They poop it out, these little microorganisms. That's what's bioavailable to the plants. That's how the plants get their food. And according to Elaine Ingham of Soil Food Web, she's a soil scientist of, I think, 45 years um, and going, she um, has really developed a great program to kind of teach this, this process and why and how it works. And so what she does is she teaches you how to use a microscope and look at the soil and see. And so what you're looking for is the balance of the microbes in the soil. Now, we have a microscope. We haven't quite learned how to use it yet, 
But what we've been doing is building soil. So that's our number one crop. And we know it's alive because we test our plants. And the plants come back with these incredible amounts of nutrients in them. So what we know is what we're looking for is a balance of, of fungi and bacteria about 50-50. And that's what most plants that we want to grow for food are looking for. That's what they need. So the way we build our soil, we are pretty much guaranteeing that that's what's going on in there. So we are now working with a soil um, scientist who was trained by Dr. Elaine uh, in, in Connecticut and sending our soil samples there, which we have done in the past years, but now we're really ramping up so that we can really tune in and fine tune that soil. So that's basically how it works, and that's why it's so important. And Dr. Lane Ingham says that we are not short on nutrients anywhere on the planet. We have over 100,000 years worth of nutrients in the soil. It's just that it's not accessible because we're killing the microbes in the soil. So when we till, we're chopping them up. When we spray, we're drying them up. So we're not remembering what our predecessors knew. They knew this, the indigenous people. And so they, they, they didn't know the science, but they knew that they wanted to necessarily, in the same way we do with a microscope, but they knew that they wanted to um, basically replicate what was already happening in nature because of their innate wisdom and their connection to nature. It was, it was honored. And they understood and knew that without nature, without this you know, ecosystem, we don't have life either. So they were able to really take care of the, of the, of the land, um, which is why when I got the um, Earthkeeper rights, I took it very, very seriously. Now that's Elaine, Dr. Elaine, she's awesome. She was at University of Maryland this, uh, let's see, I guess that would have been 19 now. So there's an agricultural con conference, usually annually at the University of Maryland, and she was the, she was the uh, keynote speaker the last time. So she's really amazing. She has so much great information online. If this topic is of interest to you, she can really um, fill in a lot of blanks. And she, she's showing kind of the soil food web with the nematodes and the protozoa and the bacteria, organic matter, and, and all those things. So, um, and, I, and I can answer any questions about how do we build our soil, because anybody can do it. Everybody can do it. It is not difficult, and it's free. We use only free materials in our soil, and they're accessible. They're so accessible. They're everywhere in abundance. Uh, so it is, it is not difficult. So now that we kind of know what we, I guess, what to do, how do we do it? So we know that growing our own food will help tremendously by decentralizing our food sources. And when we do that, we know that we're kind of safe in a situation where there could be a shortage. Or um, we are also knowing where the food came from, which actually also really does matter. So a lot of the chronic illness that we're dealing with today has to do with what we're putting in our body, what our bodies are exposed to, in our water, our air, our food, our chemicals, our body, you know, our body care items from lotions to even toothpaste. So there's so many things that are getting into our cells that we're not meant to be there. And our body's having to figure out how to deal with all of that. So, and sometimes it doesn't doesn't do real well because it wasn't meant to do that. So this is, the, this is basically the essence of our chronic illness. Um, so what, what's going on? Why does it matter where we get our food? And, and the more local it is, why is it better for us? It's really an evolving scientific um, study. And so much more comes out all the time. And I know in a couple of hundred years, they're going to know so much more about why that's important. What I can tell you from what I've gleaned from the doctors that I've worked with. So Dr. Mark Hyman is one of the MDs that I absolutely love and follow. He's a functional medicine guru. And functional medicine basically is getting to the root cause of the issue. And every single system in the body is connected. Just like we're all connected, just like we're connected to that land out there as much as the land over in Spain, what's happening there. And as we know, the world's getting so much smaller. So, what happens is in our guts, we have a microbiome just like the microbiome in the soil. And the balance that needs to be out there is, is similar to what the balance needs to be in our, in our guts. So this is one of the greatest causes, one of the root causes of the chronic illness in our world today 
is our microbiome is no longer balanced. And so when things get out of balance, then you know what happens, things don't work as well. And that affects every single system in the body. Why does it affect every single system in the body? Because the food is our fuel, right? The food fuels every single cell in the body, whether it's your part of your endocrine system or your cardiovascular system, that's what the food is doing. It's teaching this, it's giving the cells what they need to perform their task. So when we give them things that they don't know what to do with and furthermore, toxify it, then we get sick and we see symptoms, okay? So the microbiome, the soil, the food that comes from the soil outside your own door or on your own deck, it has a relationship with the bacteria and the viruses and the fungus that's in that vicinity. And so the good stuff is growing in living soil. So when we eat the food right out of the garden that's grown in living soil, we are ingesting the very bacteria that we need to balance our guts. It's crazy. It's so unreal to just think about that. Um, another fact I recently learned is we literally have, we, first of all, this thing that we walk around in is a colony organism. We are literally made, 90% of, of us is not human DNA. That's a fact. You can look all this up. You can fact check it anywhere you want. NIH is my favorite source because it really is great science at NIH. Some of the other ones, you know, you get somewhat questionable in some of these things, but, but anyway, um, so we have th about 380 billion viruses in our bodies at all times. Okay, that's also a fact. And so when we are consuming food that is literally from our gardens, that is grown in living, healthy soil, we are feeding ourselves exactly what we're meant to have. And so, for example, a lot of people have heard of probiotics. If you really get into this kind of stuff, there's a great company out there called Ascended Health. This gentleman went around the world to different villages and he took samples of the bacteria off of the food of the healthiest people in the world that had the longest li lives with the least amount of disease. And that's what he puts in that little bottle that you get if you order their Ascended Health probiotics. So I think that's really, really good and I think it's really better if you can get it right out of your own, as close as possible to you in regen with regenerative soil, healthy living soil. So, and again, it's very easy. I'm telling you, it's cheaper, it's easier, it's less labor. You don't have to put anything on it. You just create this healthy living soil and you plant your plants in it and then you enjoy the food. And I don't have it here, but it's on our website um, because it, had, it required um, Wi-Fi. So there's a video that shows you one of the studies we did at the farm. My son did it actually. So it's my son and I that primarily work, work the farm with some help, a little part-time help. He did a study uh, a few years ago on a sweet potato plant, a single sweet potato plant planted in this kind of soil I'm talking about. So he created this little four by four square and it was four by four by four tall in like wire. And he put in the materials that we use, which is basically wood chips from the side of the road guys for free, uh, manure, food scraps, uh, compost, and some soil from our farm. He put one single sweet potato plant in that four by four by four area. On average, a commercial sweet potato grower grows about two to four pounds per plant. How many pounds do you think he got out of this one single plant? You got a guess of 40. Anybody else want to guess? 20. 20. The closest without going over gets a prize. 100 pounds. <laughs> That's really close. So going from two to four pounds in a conventionally you know, sprayed uh, field, he got 92 pounds out of that single sweet potato slip. So, and it could have been a little closer to 100 because he found some more after the initial harvest. It just kept going and going and going. You would not believe the plant was probably from there to that table over there when it was all like finished for the, day, for the year. So that was pretty cool. So what we realized is that was all free. It took human labor. The plant he grew from a sweet potato 
you know, that you can either grow yourself from the year before or you can pick it up at the store. Sweet potatoes are very inexpensive, but you can get those things to grow your, your plants for you. There's a video on our, my, our Facebook page today, Honey's Harvest, about how to do that. So, um, so anyway, growing your own food in living soil as close to you as possible and or supporting the farmers who are doing it that way is going to support your body. So what I absolutely love is edible landscapes. And I did a small talk on this last night for um, Annapolis Green and Homestead Gardens. That was their, their focus. And so we talked about how do you do that? And how does it look good? And it really does look good. And there's a book over here by a friend of mine, Michael Judd, who's from Frederick, Maryland, about edible landscaping with a permaculture twist is what it's called. So one of my visions and dreams for the future is that communities and their bylaws and all their, their requirements in communities accept and acknowledge that an edible landscape is the most beautiful landscape that anyone could ever have because it gives you the gift of life and it can be gorgeous. And when you can walk outside your door any day, three seasons out of the year in this area, in our climate, and pick the raspberries off the plant, the wineberries, the blackberries, the mulberries, the figs. We have so many figs growing on our farm. It's beautiful. You feel great. It feels so good to be able to eat that food. You can tell the difference. And if you go out in your bare feet, it's even better because you're getting that electromagnetic uh, pulse from the earth itself, which is another thing that's actually very important. Um, so I think that that's a great thing to do if you can speak up at your community association meetings and say, hey, this needs to be allowed. Maybe not everybody's gonna do it, but it can be part of what we even encourage. Um, so permaculture, basically it's, it's um, a way of living in a more permanent way. So we're kind of figuring out how our impact can be more positive and maybe even more regenerative in nature. Um, so like for example, on our farm, we just planted, I think we're in our seventh year with a program with the state. And I think we're on about 14,000 trees now that are all fruit and nut bearing native trees. So I know that future generations after me, as long as it's not destroyed by something in the future, will have abundant food from our farm. That to me is regeneration. So I think that that's a, a fantastic thing to consider. Even if you just put two or three trees up, they're gonna produce at some point that are fruit and nut bearing trees. Um, diversifying, <clears throat> oh yeah, so on farms. So this is important because you can speak up if you get involved in community legislation, local jurisdictions, county legislation, state legislation, federal legislation. If you ever like to do those kind of meetings, those council meetings or send in your, you know, your vote one way or the other, you know, encouraging your representatives to vote a certain way. It is really important, it's not easy. Um, and legislation to support farms and being sustainable, I think, is, is imperative for farms to continue farming, especially on these smaller acreage farms that we have now. So when they can do things like, uh, you know, maybe uh, agritourism, like the tours that we give, or a limited number of special events, um, so they're not disturbing the community, but they're keeping the farm farming versus, you know, another development. I, my fear is dependency upon, you know, outside sources for our, the things that we vitally need. And so we do that already, of course, but we can bring it back. We can bring it back home. So um, also there are a couple other things there that are a little more uh, difficult for us to really access, but uh, lots of things, oops, lots of things can be done. <laughs> um, okay, so scalability. This guy also spoke at University of Maryland, I think the year before, he was the keynote speaker. His name is Gabe Brown, and he's got great things online too. Uh, amazing guy was conventionally farming 5,000 acres in North Dakota and he said I love what he said he said you know I was living this life and we were about to lose the farm and I woke up every morning and the first thing on my mind was what is it that I'm going to kill today and he said when I when we discovered regenerative ag and how we can create a natural system with our livestock the way they graze over time. So they, they bring in the big things first, they chop the tall grasses down and the next size down like the sheep. So maybe starting with their cattle, grazing a huge field, then bringing in the sheep afterwards and then bringing in the chickens and the, and the poultry and the other things. And, and then it all works the way it works in nature. And so he said, now what I do is I think every morning when I wake up, what is it that I'm going to grow today? And so their feels, the pictures in his presentation were phenomenal. He has these cattle 
grazing in the middle of the winter in North Dakota and the grass is like above the snow or, and, the, and the cattle are almost like rooting around but the grass is still there. So this can be done and it is completely scalable and they are very profitable today as opposed to where they were before they started that. And the topsoil, he talks about how much topsoil they've grown by, by um, performing their farming this way. So it's very exciting. So we can see all kinds of different urban farming, community uh, gardens, uh, finding farms that might be willing to, you know, either rent a little space of, or trade, you know, get some food for working on the farm. I know that Roundup is supposed to not be used anymore, but I see it in most stores. So these things are, are all things that, that make it either better or make things a little more difficult. And the amount of chemicals that we have in our ecosystems, in our air, in our water, is just increasing and it's very, very dangerous for our species. Um, it does require us, if we want to have optimal health, to detox. We really do need to learn a way that is good for us to detox our bodies from these chemicals. Um, when I first went, and when we first bought the farm that we're on, 160 acres, we bought in 2009, um, myself and my three kids, uh, we, there was a farmer there who had been farming it because the previous owners um, were elderly and they were in different states and they weren't farming anymore. So the farmer, who's a, an amazing farmer, he uses conventional methods, but he is amazing and I have a lot of respect for him. He was, it was the last day of perk season and I was out in the field trying to um, get ready to meet the guy who was coming to do the perk test to see if we wanted to ever build a tenant house someday in the future, which we have never done. But um, the guy, uh, Steve Hopkins is his name, he was driving his, his tractor, a uh, big tractor, and spraying. And he rolled down the window just enough to yell out. And he said, Anna Cheney, you get out of that field right now. Don't you know I'm spraying Agent Orange out here? And I was like, and he was angry. And I was like, I, there's nothing I can do. It's the last day of perk season, and I got to stand here until the guy gets here. You know, or put, and, the, and the grass was tall, he was doing hay. So in that moment, I felt awful because I could smell the stuff, I'm breathing it in, it's like thick in the air because you have to spray that stuff when there's no wind, so it doesn't go everywhere. And so I knew that was a pretty bad exposure that I had. And I also know that it really does disrupt most of the systems in your body. So I knew that we needed to figure out a way not to have um, that on our farm anymore. So. Uh, it is true that it is not good. They know it and they have all the protection, all the things that they need, but the rest of us are not necessarily protected. So I think that if we can figure out ways to mow less, my son wants us to have an entire yard full of plants that we can eat so he doesn't have to mow anymore. He thinks it's a waste of time and a waste of money and a waste of fuel and a waste of space that could be growing food for us to enjoy. So if you can figure out ways to, um, and you can grow grass the same way too. You don't need to use those things. So if we can do that, I think that's great. So we know that's what we see when a chemical application happens, and it's true. It's really bad for you to be out there. And this is what maybe a beautiful edible landscape could look like that is done in a regenerative ag kind of way. So we can purchase, and when we go to the farmer's markets, we can talk to the farmers and ask them important questions about their agricultural practices. And they will tell you, for example, there are blueberry farmers who will say, well, we only spray at this time, and this is what we use, and this is, you know, we wash it all off, whatever, these things. So, you know, you can, you can limit your exposure and make sure you're asking the questions. Um, there's a lot that I think can happen in education. Uh, I've noticed that there are, um, there's a lot of influence in our education system from some of the big companies that pay for a lot of our educators' salaries. And I learned that firsthand. So they are very much um, persuaded to teach a certain way and teach a certain thing and a certain way of doing agriculture, which is very difficult to break out of. But um, again, if you ever have the opportunity to you know, talk about it, same thing with legislation, in Anne Arundel County, where we are, I've been working with a group, an agricultural commission, for six years. And we've been able to pass some legislation that allows agritourism, that allows on-farm beverage production, um, 
composting wasn't even legal in our county. I mean, there were crazy things. So we've, we've worked to really help the, um, the, the community with great access to really healthy, good food, and also to help farmers stay farming. So I think that's really important. I'm gonna pause here because I'm just gonna show you a few images from our farm so you can kind of see what we actually do at this farm. And, uh, and see if there are any questions about anything or if you need to get up, walk around for a minute, take a break, get some water. They've so generously provided. I did not provide that. Jefferson Patterson Park did. The water's over here and I think those are for all of you to enjoy. Any questions? You may want to get up, jump around, stretch. <laughs> or mesmerize. <laughs> mesmerize. <laughs> Either that or sleep, right? <laughs> Wake up, everybody! <laughs> We're coming down the home stretch. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay, so at our farm, um, this is why we exist. We want to help create a healthier world. We want to empower people to feel good. So maybe you'll find something when you come visit the farm or try one of these products that you be like, oh wow, I feel really good. And now you can repeat that. Do it again yourself on your own. And we always want to treat every visitor as our personal guest. Um, I do have honey, which will wake you up a little bit too. <laughs> a little sugar in there. Um, so we like to provide experiences. We have a, uh, an herbal tea workshop on Saturday in two days. And so you'll get to mix your own uh, herbal tea flavors, see the plants growing, understand how to grow them, maybe even go home with a plant. Oh, and by the way, the person who, who said, I think it was you, who said the closest without going over, who said that? Was it? 40? Uh, who said 40? You did, okay. So if you want, you get to take the dollar elderberry plant home it's two elderberries and they they will pollinate each other so you will be all set to make your own elderberry syrup which is the earth's most potent antiviral as they say so um, so at any rate we try to and uh, have you enjoy yourselves and find something that you can really relate to when you come to the farm so connection to nature lots of great food fun workshops um, we do field trips with kids and they love it uh, this one made all kinds of great things after harvesting from the gardens. This is kind of what our gardens look like. They're very much permaculture style so that we, we plant a lot of different species together so that they can help each other. <laughs> and they like that. They're happy that way. Um, this is my son Connor a few years ago. Uh, he is using comfrey, which is our number one fertilizer plant. So we grow all of our own fertilizer. We also harvest duckweed off of our ponds, which is really high in nitrogen. And that's kind of what they use, you know, they, they make it chemically, but we do it naturally. And so you, you cut the comfrey plant, which is also an herbal medicinal, and then we make a tea out of it. And then we feed the tea to our plants. So we have our own liquid fertilizer. We are, have been engaged in the hemp program with the Maryland Department of Agriculture and uh, Morgan State University. And this is our third year in, and these are little, uh, the starts of some hemp plants. And as you may know, hemp is not the same as marijuana or cannabis or weed. Um, it is a cannabis plant. However, it only has um, mainly the CBD in it. It can only have 0.3% THC, which is the psychoactive aspect of cannabis. And ours tested out last year at 0.01%. So we're, we've been fortunate not to have an issue with that because that can happen. Um, and there are some hemp plants. <laughs> Uh, he looks like he's more clean shaven now. <laughs> he, he went through a little hippie stage there. Um, and so here we have um, some of our other crops. And so honeybees have been a big part of the farm. We know that they're helping pollinate all of our plants. And we have a mul a abundance of blackberries. Pick your own. And um, these are thornless blackberries. So they're really fun be because they grow these huge, huge, delicious, juicy blackberries and they don't have any thorns. So they're really fun and easy for everyone to pick. Uh, the food forest in the background there, that's one of the latest plantings. And in our food forest, like I said, it's mainly nuts and uh, fruits. Um, we do have some other native trees uh, like tulip poplar and, and things that don't necessarily grow food for us, but they grow food for other of the ecosystem. Um, so wait, right now we have a lot of our, our black locust trees are flowering. And so that's feeding the bees early in the year when they don't have access to as many things. So that and tulip poplar, really important for the health of the bees. And back to those bees for just a second. 
Um, these things are loaded with extra boxes because the bees are produced, this, is, this was taken yesterday, um, they are producing so much honey, they're really thriving uh, this year. So the apple orchard is a small orchard where we're kind of testing out different species. This is our fourth year with apples, and it's not really one of those recommended crops in our area. They tend to like the higher elevations and do better. So we're going to keep an eye on these and see they look really, really good this year. So I'm hopeful at least one species will, will thrive. Um, so our tours every weekend, we get a variety of, of groups that come in and families, and it's just a lot of fun. We let them graze if they choose to right off the plants. Um, we have a sweet potato fest annually in the fall, usually the first weekend in November. And um, people get to dig their own sweet potatoes and they learn how to grow their own. They learn nutritional benefits of them. Under those tents back there are restaurants serving sweet potato dishes. We have live entertainment and a guest chef doing um, the, the demonstrations on how to cook with sweet potatoes. Um, and then we have private picnic sites that we do offer for reservation on the weekends. People really like that, especially during COVID, people could really distance, take their masks off and feel very safe. And, you know, I mean, they were like 50 yards apart. I mean, they're really far. So um, lots, of, lots of space on a 160 acre farm. And then some of our products, uh, elderberry syrup, I've been talking a lot about, and you can see the honeys. We go to other markets outside of the farm. The one on the left shows you our farm market. And that is in, in one of the old tobacco barns that we've restored over years since 2009. Um, and this is um, some of the more, these are all during COVID. So we were able to stay open during COVID. In fact, we grew because we had local farms that didn't have any other places to sell their products. So we opened up our barn to our community, our farming community, and we have all of our farmers are producing either non-GMO and or organically certified or just with organic methods or regenerative like us. So it's great. Um, we have six founding farmers and watermen, and then we have every, the first Sunday of every month. It, oops, I'm supposed to put that one in there. I think I must have erased it by mistake. <laughs> we have uh, about 15 to 20 vendors uh, that come the first Sunday of the month, including like a brewery, restaurants, and so you can actually enjoy your food right on site. So that is what we do, and I'm happy now to take any questions. Um, I also can tell you a little bit about um, one of my favorite programs that I offer. It's not necessarily through the farm, um, but I do have uh, clients that I work with for uh, functional nutrition and, and energy healing. I'm a certified energy healer and will hopefully graduate in the fall from the Functional Nutrition Alliance that is based on that functional medicine that I mentioned earlier. So the program, sign up tonight if you have any interest at all, it can't hurt, you don't even have to accept it if you win, but you can have a free raffle for 50% off our summer detox program. So as I mentioned with the toxins earlier in the, in the show here, um, our cells are very wise. So while they don't know what to do with the toxins, they store them. And the safest place, the, the least volatile cell in our body is a fat cell. So our toxins are stored in our fat cells because that means they're not going to float around and cause more damage in our bloodstreams or our lymph or wherever they, they might find themselves. So the, pro, the program is, is really um, wonderful. It's a 10-day program. It, it is written by the two doctors that I, that I absolutely love, Dr. Uh, Viodo and Dr. Mark Hyman. And it basically eliminates what we call the trigger foods and it brings in, you eat really, really well. You do not starve. It's not one of those kind of things. You're not juicing all the time. You're eating really good, healthy food, and it's all accessible. It's not expensive to get the food. If you can get it organically, it might cost you a little more money, but it's, it's grocery store food. Um, and of course, this time of year, we're getting a lot of the greens and things from the local farmers, so we can often find that there. It's for 10 days, and so we eliminate the trigger foods. We bring in the good stuff. We take a certain amount of uh, very special, certain specified supplements from a group called Pure Encapsulations. They don't have all the preservatives in their, in their supplements and there are no gut disruptors, which a lot of supplements do have. So if that is of any interest at all, there's a uh, clipboard in the back. You can sign up to be entered into the free raffle, which we'll pull on Sunday night. We've done one. This will be the second and the last one, raffle that is. And the det detox runs from June 5th to June 14th. Um, to make sure we are all finished before Father's Day, <laughs> so you can enjoy your Father's Day. You had a question? Yes, do you have trouble with insects eating your plants? Great question. So 
Typically, we don't have that much of a problem. However, the larger we get and the more of one type of species we grow, I anticipate that we will see more of that. Because in a biodiverse system, for example, in permaculture, they have these things they call guilds. So our very first permaculture guild was a small round garden right in front of that old tobacco barn. And in the center, you usually put the tallest tree, which could be a peach tree or an apricot tree, or in our case, we, we chose chestnut. So we have a chestnut tree there, and then you, you, bring, you kind of layer it out, so it's kind of like, a, like almost like a pyramid. And so you bring in different types of species that play nicely together and work together, and it does not encourage like that single row of all the same type of tree or whatever the thing is that, that attracts those pests. So, and then if you plant things that you know um, deters the pests, then you're, you're really helping yourself out. So a companion plant might be, for example, um, cilantro is a plant that a lot of uh, pests don't like. Uh, rosemary, basil, uh, oregano is fantastic to really ward off a lot of the pests. And then we have, um, well, marigolds was an old time favorite. And then if we can bring in ladybugs, we don't actually buy them, but if we have things that ladybugs like, or aphids, the aphids are problematic, but the ladybug population will really decimate the aphids. So a lot of times in permaculture, people will even create a little small little um, water feature close by because that encourages the amphibians, the, the life that's going to eat a lot of these predators, or yeah, a lot of these predators, they're, they're predators. Um, the uh, praying mantis is extremely helpful to have. So when you have tree systems, trees in your, in your gardens, you know, it gives, and bushes, uh, shrubs, it gives the praying mantises a place to, to go and, and lay their, you know, put their little cocoon out and then you, you get, you know, millions of praying mantises in the spring. So um, what we have done is create, and so in that permaculture bed, it's the chestnut, elderberries, nanking bush cherries, and then we start to get down to the lower things and all the way on the outside, we have strawberries. So we have wine berries in there, we have a uh, mullein, we have uh, sunroots, um, mallow, stinging nettle is awesome. That also deters things. A lot of things don't like stinging nettle. They don't like to be around it. People don't like to be around it because it stings you. Um, and then, you know, you can study, what am I growing? I love apples or peaches or whatever, but they get so many bugs on them. So you can go online and find out what will deter the pests that love these plants and plant that next to it. Now, there's another thing you can do because that doesn't always take care of it 100%. On our hemp, for example, we had to figure out what was attracting the, the pests. There's a little worm. And so we have to move some of our crops, their annual crops away from the hemp. And then you can go out there and hand pick the worms, you know, and that's what we do. Um, the other thing is though, you can create a biocomplete compost tea, which is really at the root of regenerative ag. And that is what Elaine Ingham teaches is how to use biocomplete compost tea and extracts on the foliage, like as a foliar treatment, just like somebody would spray a pesticide on there. Um, because what you're actually doing is you're giving the plant the nutrients that it needs to be healthy and have a strong immune system. So most plants, all plants, if they're healthy, should be able to fight off the pests and the diseases. But when they're not balanced, or the soil in which they grow isn't balanced, they're going to be prone to the fungal diseases, the, the pests, um, any uh, other bacteria that might affect them. I'm trying to think of like bugs, you know, aphids, any other, oh, um, like powdery mildew, uh, different things that, but as long as your plant is, has a strong immune system, just like humans, you should be able to fight off just about anything that comes your way. It's the, the problem comes when we're just not balanced anymore. And unfortunately, the majority of our population is out of balance in some way or another. So that's when we become prone, just like the plants. So the BioComplete compost tea, it's not a secret, it's online. Um, there are many recipes for it. You basically have to start with a living soil and all you're doing is, is like making a tea. And you, you can brew it for overnight and you need a little five gallon bucket, and a little bubbler, a very special little bag, like a tea bag, uh, that's very, very fine so that your, your, you know, really living soil is not going to get through that because if you're going to put it in the sprayer, you can't clog up your sprayer. So 
there are solutions. And my son said to me a long time ago, his little guy, he must have been 12 or something, and he said, you know, Mom, for every ailment that we have as humans, there is a natural remedy. And I was like, what? And because I was still kind of in that old conventional, you know, thought philosophy of, yeah, for every ailment, I've got a headache, I'm going to take an aspirin, or, you know, take an ibuprofen. Like, no, 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 no. Eat a sweet potato. Sweet pot orange vegetables help you get rid of headaches. That's great. And it's true. It's amazing. And you can, you can eat a willow branch, you know, chew on a willow branch, and you're going to relieve pain. You have hemp. Fantastic pain reliever. So over time, what I've learned is it's really, a, just like the plants, people are the same. It's all about the environment of the body or the terrain. And that's what Louis Pasteur said on his deathbed. It's not about the pathogen. It's about the terrain. Because if the terrain is healthy and strong, it can deal with the pathogen. So... I found that interesting um, to learn over time with the pasteurization process. He's basically saying it's not necessary because as long as we're healthy and we're not you know, practicing things that we used to practice, which were very unsanitary, <laughs> then we're going to be able to deal with what comes our way. So um, with that, are there any other questions? Yes? Actually, I have several questions. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So, where is your farm? Have you ever read anything by Dr. Joel Perlman and read these letters? Sounds like a lot of things that he says are so, so much of what you're doing. Um, I want you to know about your uh, manure. You use horse manure. I like that's a good additive. And then um, the last question is I wonder if you talk a little about your journey back to health, how long that took. Mm, okay. Sure. Okay, so the first question is, we're located in Lothian, Maryland. Um, it took me about, I think, 40 minutes to get here. Um, so we're just north, um, north of Prince Frederick, and up Route 4, and then it's pretty easy from there, Route 2. One left-hand turn, one right-hand turn, and you're there. It's really straightforward. Um, the, I've heard of those people that you mentioned, and I've probably seen something, but in my current life i'm not as much of a reader as i used to be i think it's just because i'm like working 24 7 almost um, and so i learn very well verbally you know <laughs> listen to a lot of things but i've definitely heard of both of them especially the first guy joel Furman. yeah he wrote Eat to Live. yes 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 i think actually somebody gave me that book and i haven't read it yet so yes i have that book um yeah he's he's cool he's a farmer right he, virginia um, is that the one no, I know Joel Salatin. There's no, he's, not a he's, a, he's a doctor. He's a doctor. Okay, yeah. No, I don't have that book. I don't have that one. Um, and then, let's horse, see. Horse manure. Horse manure. Horse manure is great. Um, the key with manures, any manures, is the state in which you get it and then the state in which you use it and what you're using it for. So we use horse manure too. We use horse manure from a guy who feeds his horses organically. So we're kind of lucky. It happens to be almost right across the road from us. And we like to compost it before we put it, you know, in the gardens. So if you're getting it to a state where it's not um, hot anymore, and we, we try to mix it with carbon, so um, grass clippings, uh, anything left over from your garden from before, uh, you know, leaves, bark, uh, wood chips. Wood chips are high in carbon, really high in carbon, great carbon. And then we keep turning it. We usually uh, compost it for at least six months, um, but you can speed that up quite a bit. So that is great, great source of your nitrogen. And a certain type of I'm sorry. A certain type of wood chip? So that's a great question too. Um, you can use just about any type of wood chip from the side of the road that's not been treated, um, but those are also going to need to compost because we never really know what they deworm their horses with or what's really in the food that they're feeding their horses or who sprayed what on the side of the road on the tree that got chipped up. Um, so the key is that the microorganisms during the composting, they do break all of those things down. So unless they're being sprayed with those forever chemicals that they talk about, which is I think pretty unlikely, then um, they're gonna compost out, you know, into, they're gonna be broken down. 
So the wood chips are great because they do so many things. First of all, they provide your carbon in your compost. Uh, second of all, if you, if you let your wood chips, if you just keep a pile of wood chips that you get free from those guys on the side of the road, if you stop and talk to them and just give them a card or a piece of paper with your address on it, they'll come dump the chips on your property for you. And then you can let them just sit and compost if you have a place to do that because they'll break down over time and they pull in the, the fungal material. They grow mycelium, they grow mushrooms. And you can even put mushroom stuff on them to make them grow. But that's really, really good for the soil. So, and then what happens is if you get them composted for a year, they're gonna turn like a, a darker brown cut black color and they're gonna have all this mycelium growing in them. And then you can put them right on top of your, your beds of whatever it is that you're growing. And what that does is it keeps the water in the soil because it's protecting it from the sun. And it was in a drought, like now. We haven't had rain for a while. And we were literally just talking about this earlier because we're growing so, mo so many things right now. And my son said, can you imagine if we didn't have wood chips on our gardens right now? The amount of watering that would need to be done, it would be crazy. We couldn't do it, we couldn't keep up with it. So the wood chips are very sustainable. They also help in a flood or in a, in a very uh, significant rain event. So a few years ago, we had one of those early in the year in the growing season, like maybe midsummer or something like that. And our, our peers, their, their gardens, we saw them, they're just washed away, no tomatoes. Do you remember the year when there were no tomatoes? So in my son's garden, he had tomatoes till November because the way that we farm, I don't know if that, pig, I think I, um, the way that we farm, we, we top all of our rows with wood chips, composted wood chips, so that um, when we have, oops, there it was. Okay, so on the left, those are actual, those are our rows. That's how we, that's how we farm. We, we build the soil, we grow the soil, and then we, we create these rows, and then we put wood chips on top, and that prevents, in a rain event, all of the soil from washing away. So, you know, of course the food forest is a little different. It's right there in the field, which we've been growing topsoil on for years, but um, it's really a great thing to have is those free wood chips. So from composting to protecting, to uh, keeping things hydrated and to allowing the water to percolate through in the rain events so it doesn't whoosh, just wash it out, it's an amazing free product. It's imperative to the way we farm. And let's see, journey to health, journey to health. okay. So the short version is, um, I did work with acupuncturists, massage therapists. Um, I still worked with the doctor I was working with. He was an MD. He was supposed to be a holistic MD, but he was really dependent upon um, med medicine. Um, and what I learned since then, well, first started with, it was the first part of the journey was chronic Lyme, debilitating chronic Lyme to the point where I lost my memory, couldn't remember my mother's phone number, um, names of people. And I was, um, you know, just in so much pain <laughs> in my entire body, every joint in my body, that I didn't even know that I, when I severed a rotator cuff, severed it, didn't even know. So I walked around with a severed rotator cuff for so long and it just wouldn't work right. <laughs> but I was in that much pain all the time that it didn't make any difference. And so I got that fixed too, obviously. But um, and then, were, then my body just started to really deteriorate and fall apart and I had all kinds of uh, chronic issues going on. So, and the fatigue was overwhelming and I was very energetic just like I am now up until that time. So, and then I had these three little tiny kids, I think three, five and seven or something and just like a you know, mess. So um, what happened was in a short, in the short version, I found I, I, in my mind, after trying all these alternative things, I kept hearing this voice saying energy medicine, energy medicine, energy medicine. I didn't know what it was. And I thought to myself, there is no way I'm going to go to anybody who does energy medicine. I don't know what it is. It sounds crazy. But it kept coming back, right? And nothing was working. So I finally asked my friend who I knew would know some crazy person who does something called energy medicine. And she said, go down to this place. And I was like, oh, I don't even want to go to that area. That area is sketchy to begin with. She said, no, I promise you it's all good. She, she rents out the loft in this little hair salon in the bottom where, you know, all the ladies go and get their hair done and it's, it's going to be fine. It's like a little log cabin. I'm like, <laughs> so I was like, okay, fine. I was desperate. So I went 
and I went in there and you know there was a very young lady and she met me and we went upstairs and she said well, well hi what, what are you here for and I said energy medicine and she said what kind and I said oh and I remember it so well it was August I was in my like work attire and a suit because I was doing the, the food service at the time and catering and I thought and I was sweating, and it was air conditioned in there, it was nice, but I was so nervous. And all I could think about was if somebody saw my car outside of it, what they would be thinking of me. And so I was like frantic, and I was, I was so nervous that I couldn't even think about what she was saying. And I said, I said, what kind do you have? And she said, and she handed me a menu. And I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. So I remember looking at it, I couldn't read, but I saw like a rainbow or something. I'm like, oh, that looks pretty. <laughs> I was like, I'll have that one. And she said, oh, rainbow medicine. And I said, yeah. And she said, okay, stand over there. And I was like, and fully clothed in my suit, the whole nine, stand over there. And she said, just try to relax, close your eyes. And I was like, yeah, right. And so she sat down and I'm like, I'm standing up. So she sat down and she said, I'm going to track you. And I was like, okay. And so I'm like standing there like, ooh, what if my mom sees me, if my dad sees me, they're gonna think I'm crazy, what am I doing here? Uh, that's all I could think about. And finally, I started to relax. And then I could hear her over there with a pen and paper and she was like writing this stuff down. And I was like, and then I could hear her mumbling. And I was like, oh my goodness, who is she talking to? And, uh, and then she said, okay, after I finally started to, to drift off into almost like a dream state. And I had these visions that I can clearly see today. And I was like, ooh, this is kind of neat. And then she said, okay, I'm finished. I'm like, darn it. And so she said, you can just have a seat over there. I'm okay. And then she started asking me some questions. And she said, have you recently injured your right shoulder? And I was like, well, yeah, when I was 15. I said, do you know how old I am? I mean, I had a, I had a compound fracture from a horseback riding accident. And she's like, no, there's still something going on in there. And like I said, I had severed my rotator cuff, but had no idea. And so I went and got it checked, you know, afterwards. And sure enough, two opinions, two doctors both said, you've severed your rotator cuff, you need surgery. And then it went on. So she went on with other things and I was kind of freaked out a little bit. Um, so she said, it did some kind of thing, it was energy work and stuff. And I was like, okay. So then I left and then I felt a little better, a little different. So I was attracted to going back again. So I made an appointment for two weeks later, six months later, I felt like a new person. I was off of 18 pills a day. I was taking nothing. I was Lyme free. I had other things that had begun to manifest in the body, miraculously gone, was told they would not go away unless I had surgery or something worse happened. And um, my rotator cuff was healed in surgery perfectly and you know could do everything that I did before. In fact, when I went to physical therapy, they asked me, they said, well, you're doing your exercises. And I was like, just the same as I always have, but I was getting something called myofascial massage from her. And she was also um, working on energetic level. So, so really it was a six month process and I really got into it. And I did a lot of reading during that time. Um, uh, another doctor I love, Dr. Christiane Northrup. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of her. She's written some books called, uh, lots of books now, but the one at the time that I was reading was women's bodies, women's wisdom. And it kind of, cor she was an MD, uh, OBGYN, and she correlated, she had learned over time that the energetics of life and living life and the things that happen to us, they're literally stored in our electromagnetic energetic field. So we have, we actually have that. And so, and in the cells, every cell, I got to talk to a scientist from NIST this year about COVID. Um, he was studying COVID and uh, his, his National Institutes of Science and Technology. Great conversation with him. Most of it went over my head. But he, I learned some things and he said, there's one thing I can tell you for sure, 100%. I don't care what anybody says in science. This is one thing that every scientist should tell you. And I said, what's that? He said, when you break everything down to the teeniest, tiniest particle ever, it's made of energy, period. Everything is made of energy. And I was like, oh good, well now I know why all this energy stuff works <laughs> because that's what we're made of. So it took about six months to get really well again. And then from there I kept, I realized that we, we're, we change, right? We're, we're not static. We're constantly changing. And whatever's happening in the world, 
with our neighbors, with our kids, with our parents, with our families, with our friends, the food, our, everything. This is all impacting us and we're changing. And so we need to continue to care for ourselves. So I would feel so good for a long time and then wham, something would happen like Hurricane Irene in the middle of a bunch of catering, catering events. You know, so, and so you, got, you have to remember and learn what does this particular biome need to stay energetic and vital and relevant and healthy as long as possible. And that's what Dr. Dr. Alberto Viodo teaches, which is when I learned about him from this energy healer because she had gone to his school. And that when we take care of ourselves that way, we can have optimal health for our lifespan. And so that is the essence of why I do the detox program, because we're constantly bombarded with toxins, constantly bombarded with toxins. And so when we detox, we are detoxing mainly on the physical level because it's a food-based program, um, but we do a lot of support and learning about the energetics along the way. So we do two weeks of prep work, it's all online, you can certainly come to the farm in person and we have a new farmhouse retreat. It's on a separate property, but it was the original farmhouse at Honey's Harvest Farm. So there's an overnight option as well for people who want to have a chef treat them to these wonderful, delicious foods and teach them how to make them. Um, our, this is our first weekend offering that starting June 5th. So um, yeah, so the detox I think is key uh, to really um, optimal health for your lifespan. Great questions. Thank you. And somebody else had a question? Yes. <laughs> um, so I've heard about using the comfrey as a chop and drop fertilizer for other things. A, is that what you guys are doing? And B, I'm interested in using yarrow or other nutrient miners. Have you tried other plants? Do, are they as effective? Yes. Um, so yes, we do drop, we chop and drop also. So especially at the end of the season, we use it throughout the season and we do use it in our biocomplete compost teas. You can also make a sun tea with, with, with these kinds of plants. Um, so anything that's a bioaccumulator like comfrey um, will be full of nutrients. So you can literally chop those leaves up, put them in water, stick them outside in the sun, and then use that in your house plants. You can use it in your gardens and it's just going to really feed the soil and it's going to feed the plant. Um, if you let it go longer, it's not necessarily feeding the soil because it can go um, uh, anaerobic, but it will still nutrify the plant. It will give nutrients to the plant. So as long as you're remembering that biology in there, maybe giving it something too, then you can do it that way. So yes, I, and then I have not used yarrow, but we did just plant a bunch of it last year. And um, we do use any kind of hemp that we're not gonna be using in our products. So if we have excess hemp, because that's also a bioaccumulator, we'll literally just chop that up and we, we're actually making a tea right now with it. So yeah, it's a great thing to do. Really good idea. Yep. And, and basically free if you're growing it. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, so great question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as far as the deer go, there is something that I can recommend um, that's highly recommend actually. We've used a couple things. We made our own like deer away stuff with, we used to raise chickens. <laughs> so you can like have rotten eggs <laughs> and make it, that's what they're made of and a couple other herbs. I mean uh, like cayenne pepper and things like that. Oh yeah, there is another treatment for pests by the way. Lots of treatment. You can look up all kinds of great things for pests. But for the deer, um, there's something they sell. You can buy it on Amazon. It sounds crazy. It works so well. It's called a hoont, H-O-O-N-T, hoont. And it's a little um, ultrasonic, uh, motion censored. Um, it, it puts out, it emits like an ultrasonic sound, like a high pitched sound that some people can't even hear. Um, but that irritates the heck out of the deer. They'll go as far away from it as they can get. And it says it only has like a 30 foot um, distance, but it, it actually works better than what it says. And so you could be, you know, pretty far away and, in, and it does like 180 degrees. So it's this little thing on a stem and you just stick it in the ground and you turn it on. There are different um, 
frequencies for different types of pests. So from the little ones to the big ones. <laughs> and it, it works flawlessly and it's solar powered. So we love them. They're about 40 bucks a piece. And um, we've actually trained the deer to stay away from a lot of our gardens, knock on wood. So we have some that we haven't even put out yet. But there's some areas that we are, you know, you're always going to have to put those out. So that's, that's definitely the quickest and easiest way. It does. Yeah, it does. Now it's a different. You can shoot them, yeah. Is that what you said? <laughs> so, the, what's that? That's what my son talks about. So, he does not like them. And he thinks that they, I mean, every, we know that everything affects everything, right? In some way or another. So, I tell him when he's extremely frustrated with the deer, you know, you have a choice. Do you want your plants or not? So, is it, it is a compromise for sure and we while we don't know exactly what it's doing to the plants um, once the deer are trained they find a different path they will stay far away from that thing so it's not going to be going off as much and you can even like right now i mean i'm making myself a little nervous we don't really have any out right now and we have a lot of things growing and so far we haven't had the issues but also when you like you can grow your gardens your organic gardens in a more permaculture style that is going to confuse them because there are going to be different things growing at different heights and all kinds of things. And it's, it's not going to look as attractive as just this one nice, beautiful row of delicious looking whatever it is that they want to eat, you know? So um, that, that would be something to experiment with because you could just do one area in more of a permaculture style, you know, without a hoot and then put the hoot up over here with the, your annual vegetables or something and see which, you know, which one works better. And what are you willing to, to live with, basically? Yeah. So Max Field Guide. Max Field Guide. Great. That's a great one. Great resource. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything? All right. Well, It is. It really is. There's a fantastic documentary called Symphony of the Soil, where the, it shows you basically how that's going on under the ground. So it's a great one if you want to check out a documentary that's all about that communication, that synergy. Where can you find it? Symphony of the Soil? I think the last time I saw it was on Vimeo, um, but I think it may, it may be on Netflix. Yeah. You're welcome. Well, thank you again. I hope to see you at Honey's Harvest Farm in the near future. If you can make it up and over here at the table, if you're interested in sampling either our hemp honey, our regular honey, or our elderberry syrup, I have samples for you. And anything, if you want to take something home, you're more than welcome to purchase. Um, but again, you can come to the farm and you'll see a much bigger spread and lots of other vendors. And you can make a day of it, get your picnic site, do the walk with us and see all this stuff in real life and see if I'm telling the truth or not. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.